Welcome to lecture 19, the Cauchy theorem, integrals of analytic functions vanish, and an introduction to the idea of residues. So the Cauchy theorem is probably one of the most important theorems in complex variables, and it takes a couple of different forms. We're going to show two of the different forms for you here in this lecture. This lecture is going to be a bit long, so please pay attention and stay with it. Uh, the Cauchy theorem, the first form of the Cauchy theorem is essentially Stokes' theorem, but for systems that have a vanishing curl, in other words, we're going to be showing the path independence of the integral and the vanishing of an integral for a closed path. It requires a bit of care to convert from Stokes to Cauchy because of factors of i and dealing with the fact that we're looking at complex valued functions as opposed to real functions and we're converting i's into uh, components along the y-axis and real numbers as components along the x-axis. So let's start off. Let's consider the integral of a complex function along some path between two points a and b. It looks like the following, the integral of dz f of z. And if I use our old notation of f is equal to u plus iv, and I write dz as dx plus i dy, then I get the following form, u of xy plus iv of xy times dx plus i dy. And now I want to collect the real and imaginary parts of this. So the real parts will be u of xy dx minus v of xy dy. We get the minus sign because there's an i squared. And then I get plus i times v of xy dx plus u of xy dy. Okay, we want to try and write this in terms of Stokes. Let's look at each of those pieces. We're going to pick our tangent vector to be dx times the unit vector in the x direction plus dy times the unit vector in the y direction divided by ds. And we're going to pick two real valued vector fields to be f1 is equal to u times i hat minus v times j hat, and f2 is going to be v times i hat plus u times j hat. And now if we look at the dot product of f1 dot t, well f1 dot t is going to give me a u dx minus v dy, and indeed that is the real part of the integral of f of z dz. And then the imaginary part has a v dx plus u dy. If I look at f2 dotted into t, I get a v dx plus a u dy, and indeed that's exactly what the imaginary component is. So we've broken up the full integral by looking at its real and imaginary parts in terms of two integrals, two line integrals of real valued functions where we're integrating along the tangent direction of some particular curve and we're integrating along that curve with the ds. Now that is exactly in the form where we can apply Stokes theorem. So we now have to take a look at determining what the curl is of each of those vector fields and it's only the k component of the curl that we're interested in because we're working in two dimensions. And so the curl is just df1 or dfy dx minus dfx dy. That's the z component of the curl. And if I look down here to the left hand side, I can see that fy is equal to u and fx is equal to minus v. So I'm sorry, fx is equal to u and fy is equal to minus v. So when I substitute in for fy and fx for f1, I get minus dv dx minus du dy. Now it turns out that's actually equal to zero, and I'll explain why in just a moment. Let's do the same thing for the curl of f2. That's going to be dfy dx minus dfx dy. fy is equal to u. fx is equal to v, so I get du dx minus dv dy, and I'm going to set that equal to zero as well because we have the cauchy riemann equations. Remember, we said that f was an analytic function, and if it's an, an if it's an analytic function, then u and v must satisfy the cauchy riemann equations. And the cauchy riemann equations say that each of those components of the curl is equal to zero. Now we know from Stokes' theorem when the curl is equal to zero, then the integral is path in independent. And when we put this together for both the real and the imaginary parts, what we find is the integral of analytic functions over the complex plane is independent of the path of integration. And so it doesn't matter. I don't even have to tell you what the path is. I just need to tell you the endpoint. That's all that you need in order to determine what the integral is of an analytic function. So 
in particular if that function is a closed path so the initial point and the final point are the same then we know that the integral must be zero so any integral over any closed path of an analytic function where it's analytic in the interior of the closed curve is going to equal zero now this means that there's no singularities no discontinuities no nasty things called branch cuts occurring on the interior of the curve but as long as that is true and it's a purely analytic function then the integral is equal to zero so that is cauchy's theorem in its first form Let's show how this works. Let's take a actual analytic function, e to the z, and we're going to integrate it from 1 to i along the quarter unit circle in the counterclockwise dire direction. The path can be written as gamma of t is cosine t plus i sine t for 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to pi over 2. I get dz by taking the derivative of that. It's equal to minus sine t plus i cosine t dt. And so we get the integral from 0 to pi over 2 dt of e to the cosine t plus i sine t times minus sine t plus i cosine t dt. Let's expand out that exponential. e to the i sine t is cosine sine t plus i sine of sine t. And now let's multiply out and get the real and imaginary parts to this. So I get e to the cosine t times minus cosine sine t times sine t minus sine of sine t times cosine t minus i sine of sine t times sine t plus i cosine of sine t times cosine t and now it turns out if you look very carefully at this and you stare at it for a while and you reorganize some of the terms you find that this is actually a total derivative it's a total derivative of e to the cosine t times cosine of sine t plus i e to the cosine t times sine of sine t let's just take a look at a couple of terms so if I take the derivative of e to the cosine t cosine of sine t, I'll get e to the cosine t cosine of sine t times minus sine t. That's the first term in the above equation. And then I'll also get a term that is e to the cosine t times minus sine of sine t times the derivative of sine t, which is cosine t. So that is the second term. And similarly, you can work out the third terms and verify that those and the fourth terms and verify that they're the same. So since this is a total derivative, I can immediately evaluate the integral. It's equal to the thing in the curly braces evaluated at the two endpoints. So when I evaluate at pi over two, cosine of pi over two is zero, sine of pi over two is equal to one, so that becomes cosine one. And when I uh, plus i times sine of one. And when I evaluate it when t is equal to 0, I get e to the 1 times 1 plus i e to the 1 times 0. And when I look at that all together, I get a cosine 1 plus i sine 1 minus 1 e to the 1. Now, cosine 1 plus i sine 1, that's just e to the i times 1, or e to the i. And so the final answer is just e to the i minus e to the 1. Now, please remember that e to the i minus e to the 1, because we're going to evaluate this in a, along a different path now. We're going to go along this L path that goes along the x-axis first, then goes along the y-axis. And we have to figure out how to parametrize that. We're going to have two pieces to the parameterization. The first one is 1 minus t for 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 1. That's along that x-axis. And then we have it for 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 1. That's going along the y-axis and then dz is just gamma prime of t dt and that's going to either equal minus 1 or i depending upon which path I'm on and so we get an integral from 0 to 1 dt of minus 1 times e to the 1 minus t plus an integral from 0 to 1 dt of i times e to the i t those are both integrals I can immediately work out and I get e to the 1 minus t evaluated between 0 and 1 plus e to the i t evaluated between 0 and 1 so let's go ahead and do that it's going to give me e to the i minus 1 plus 1 minus e to the 1. The 1 and the minus 1 cancel, and I'm left with e to the i minus e to the 1, which is exactly what we had with the previous integral. And so we have shown that the integral of this analytic function is consistent with being path independent. We haven't actually proven it. Uh, the proof actually relies on the Stokes theorem, which we've already proven. Uh, you just have to remember that we already established the exponential function as analytic because it satisfied the cauchy riemann equations. We did that in an earlier lecture. All right, let's now go on to an extension of Cauchy's theorem. 
and we're going to be looking at integrals around a path z0, and we're going to be looking at integrating around a unit circle in a counterclockwise direction about the point z0. So what are we going to do? We're going to actually take a look at powers z minus z0 raised to the nth power integrated along a unit circle that's centered at z0 in the counterclockwise direction. So I want the integral dz of z minus z0 raised to the nth power. And what I have to recognize is that that's actually a perfect differential. It can be written as d by dz of z minus z0 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1, as long as n doesn't equal minus 1. If n equals minus 1, then of course that formula doesn't hold because I'm dividing by 0. So for every case except n equals minus 1, I have a perfect derivative. And so I can evaluate that by evaluating the antiderivative between the start and the end point, but the start and the end point are the same, so it's just equal to zero. So that integral is going to be equal to zero for all n except n equals minus one. So now we have to work with the n equals minus one case. So we're going to write gamma as z zero plus e to the i t for zero less than or equal to t less than or equal to two pi. And then the integral dz of one over z minus z zero is an integral from zero to two pi dt. I need gamma prime of t, that's i e to the i t. And then I need 1 over z minus z0, where 1 over z minus z0 is 1 over e to the i t. And you can see now the e to the i t factors cancel. I'm just left with i integrated between 0 and 2 pi. So that just equals 2 pi i. So we can summarize this, that the integral around a closed path of z minus z0 to the nth power is equal to 0 if n does not equal minus 1, and it's equal to 2 pi i if n is equal to minus 1. Okay, that's the really critical result that we're going to need. Please remember this. I'm going to remind you of what it is in order to perform to uh, prove the second form of Cauchy's theorem. So the extension or the second form of Cauchy's theorem is that f evaluated at z0 can be written as the integral around a path that surrounds z0 of dz over 2 pi i f of z times z minus z0. And now you can think in your mind that we're doing that same integral over that unit circle, but in reality, because this analytic function is path independent, we can really pick any path as long as it surrounds z0 and we're integrating around it in a counterclockwise direction. So for the proof, what we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that f of z can be evaluated in a Taylor series. That's one of the properties of analytic functions. They can always be evaluated in a Taylor series expansion. And so the integral becomes the integral dz over 2 pi i, 1 over z minus z0, and now I have my Taylor series expansion about z0. f of z0 plus f prime of z0 times z minus z0 plus 1 half f double prime of z0 times z minus z0 squared, and so forth. And that series goes on an infinite number of terms. Now if you look, my integral now has, has become integrals of powers of z minus z0, and all of the powers are bigger than or equal to minus 1. Now we know when n is equal to minus 1, that integral is going to equal 2 pi i. That'll cancel the 1 over 2 pi i and leave me just with f of z0. And all of the other powers are powers that are bigger than minus 1. And we know that the integral for all of those powers is equal to 0. So all of the other terms will integrate to 0. And I'm just left with the one term that is non zero, which is the first term, and then the integral is equal to f of z0. So that immediately gives us the proof of the second form of Cauchy's theorem. Now, while this derivation was straightforward, the meaning is really remarkable if you think about it. The value of the function everywhere inside the curve is determined by the value of the function on the boundary of the curve. So if you give me the value of the function along some boundary, I can tell you what the value of the function is at every point in the interior of the curve. That's really remarkable, and I get it by using this Cauchy, uh, this second form of the Cauchy theorem. This is true for all analytic functions, so it's a really remarkable, really powerful result. The function determined everywhere on the interior of a closed path is given by the values of the function along the closed path itself. Okay, there's one more thing we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about something called a Laurent series. And this is very closely related to a Taylor series, but it also can handle functions that have a finite number of singularities. They can be expanded in what is called a Taylor uh, Lorentz series, which is like a Taylor series, 
but it has a couple of extra terms. So it looks like 1 over n factorial b to the minus n, b to the minus n is a number, 1 over z minus z0 to the n plus 1 over n minus 1 factorial b to the minus n plus 1, 1 over z minus z0 to the n minus 1, and so forth, all the way down to b to the minus 1, 1 over z minus z0. Those are all the extra terms in the Lorentz series that we don't normally have in the Taylor series. And then we have all the terms in the Taylor series, the a0 plus the a1z minus z0 plus the 1 half a2z minus z0 squared plus the 1 over 3 factorial a3z minus z0 cubed and so forth. And that series goes on an infinite number of terms. One of these terms in the Lorentz series is extremely important. It's the term, the coefficient b to the minus 1. That term is called the residue. If we have an analytic function f of z, and then we form a different function g of z, which is f of z over z by z0, then the residue of g of z at z equals z0 is just equal to f of z0. And that simply follows from the Taylor series expansion, similar to what we did when we were proving the second form of the Cauchy theorem. And this is true for all analytic functions. What we're going to find next time is we're going to talk about how to actually evaluate integrals by using special properties about these residues. This turns out to be an extremely powerful method for doing integrals. It's probably the most powerful general method that can be used for doing integrals. And it is something that everyone should see and hopefully be able to master and be able to use. And that's what I'm going to be trying to teach you in the course of the next lecture and I will hopefully be able to give you enough expertise that you become comfortable after you've practiced it with actually calculating integrals via residues and you're going to be amazed at the kinds of things that you can do with this since I suspect most of you have never seen how to calculate integrals via residues. And that's all that we have for this lecture.